And our first speaker is a Baylor legend, and indeed a legend among any of those who are Inklings fans. And he has been teaching, I discovered on Wednesday when we uh, participated in an interview for chapel for 41 years, which is, he began, the, he, the fall in which he began teaching was the fall which I, in which I began. <laughs> um, and so I thought it was fitting to start with Dr. Ralph Wood uh, to get us off on the right kind of start. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. There's, he's one person who just every time he speaks, there's wisdom. Not just interesting facts, not just entertaining, but actual wisdom when he speaks. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Ralph Wood. Thank you very much. And since, like Egyptian mummies, we are pressed for time, bad fun. I see that my students are all Seventh-day horizontalists on the Lord's Day. They're also apparently Sabbath-day horizontalists. So thanks for coming. Let's dive right in. I want to argue that we honor C.S. Lewis best by viewing him critically rather than worshipfully. That is to say, by judging what is both right and good in C.S. Lewis, but also honestly admitting that he went off the rails at certain points and that we cannot honor him rightly unless we acknowledge the points at which I believe he went off the rails. To say that is um, to say also that we best honor our dead on their death days, not their birthdays. The saints of the church are not celebrated on the day of their birth, which in some sense doesn't matter. They're celebrated on the day of their deaths, when their lives come to a full, final completion, culmination, they having taken the talents they've been given and returned them fully to the Lord, multiplied sevenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. C.S. Lewis, therefore, is to be remembered on his death day far more than on his birthday. I want to do so by honoring that there are several Lewises. James Como, one of his best friends, says he could count at least five. Um, but even Owen Barfield, his, his very close friend, said that he always felt he was dealing with at least two Lewises, not only in public, also in private, but he said even when Lewis was absent, I always felt I was confronting at least two Lewises. And so I want to make a similar case today that while there is, of course, an integrity to C.S. Lewis, a wholeness, a oneness, he is a man deeply divided within that wholeness, and the two sides of him, I think, are what I'm going to be calling a rationalist uh, apologetics that operates within an essentially enlightenment framework. So I'm going to be making what is obviously a very controversial case that C.S. Lewis, who thought himself to be a dinosaur, a throwback, at least to the Middle Ages, if not further, was in fact a thoroughly thoroughgoing modernist and that we must acknowledge that if we are to honor and read him rightly. At the same time, however, I want to say he broke free of the shackles, uh, the worst shackles of modernism in his imaginative work, where he doesn't any longer operate according to, at least not wholly according to, the protocols of the Enlightenment. And so let me make that case, if I can, as quickly um, as, as possible. Uh, the book I'm relying on, uh, honestly, has just been published. I should have listed it here and didn't. I urge you to read it. It's going to change the whole foundation of Lewis studies. It's by a Baylor doctorate named Samuel Jokel, J-O-E-C-K-E-L. It's called The Lewis Phenomenon, uh, published by Mercer Press uh, 2013. Samuel Jokel, J-O-E-C-K-E-L, The Lewis Phenomenon. And there, I think he shows without any um, serious fault that Lewis, um, as a man of his time, what else could he be but a man of his time? What else can we be but people of our time? War enlightenment lenses. That is to say, he held to the view that there is a perspective from nowhere, that one can stand above all traditions neutrally so as to view them 
as to their strengths and their failures, that one can dwell in a kind of timeless, eternal place and view things, therefore, without wearing glasses. When, of course, it seems to me now we have come to understand that is simply impossible. There is no unlensed seeing. Better put, there is no untraditioned thinking or writing. In the book I'm relying on here, I could not commend more highly. It's simply Alistair McIntyre's book, Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry, than which there is no less sexy title ever given to a book. <laughs> this book will change your life if you haven't read it. I urge you to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest that book. I'll be relying on it heavily, though not referring to it specifically. Well, I want to argue, I've said this at more length elsewhere, that two points at which Lewis fails grossly, I think, not minimally, but grossly, concerns the problem of evil on the one hand and the notion of a kind of um, timeless, placeless, objective morality. So let's turn, first of all, to the problem of evil. As you know, he famously describes it in the problem of pain as God's way of getting our attention. Um, I always, when I read that, to me, worst of all phrases from that book, um, and it's in the small print there, the human spirit will not even begin to try to surrender self-will as long as all seems to be well with it. But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. Pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. When I read that passage, I shudder. I can't think of a worse phrase to give to a person in extraordinary pain, whether mental, spiritual, or even moral. That's the, that's the advice of death. Pain turns people away from God on the whole. Uh, tell that to a friend of mine, for example, who suffers from congenital syphilis. That is to say, his father, a major pastor in the Fort Worth area, was visiting the brothels of Fort Worth in secret and contracted syphilis there and passed it on to his son. If you can see how that son walks and how that son has to talk with a terribly fixed uh, hard palate that's inoperable, such as cleft palate is not, you would not ever want to say to him what I've just read. In fact, he once said to me when I read A Grief Observed, <clears throat> I shouted with great glee and joy. C.S. Lewis at last got to hear God's megaphone. Lewis himself came to see the fallacy of that position at the end. And these quotes are from a grief observed. Look how he takes everything back in this passage that he got wrong. This is a passage you can give to a person who has congenital syphilis or any other dread disease. And of course, the best book to give is, is, is the, the Brothers Karamazov. You cannot read Ivan Karamazov's treatise on the problem of evil and say things like God's megaphone to a deaf world. Listen to Lewis instead. There is nothing we can do with suffering except to suffer it. It's precisely what Flannery O'Connor said, a woman who died at 39 of disseminated lupus erythematosus. She said, suffering is not a problem to be explained. Suffering is a mystery to be endured. What is grief, he asked, when compared with physical pain? Whatever fools may say, he's referring to himself there, of course, the body can suffer 20 times more than the mind. Grief is like a bomber circling round and dropping its bombs each time the circle brings it overhead. Physical pain is like the steady barrage on a trench in World War I where Lewis, of course, had been. Hours of it with no let up even for a moment. Therefore, when you have that view of, the, of, of real evil, real pain, look what it does to your nice, neat, formulated images of God. Images of the holy quickly become holy images, sacrosanct. My idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. He shatters it himself. 
God is the great iconoclast. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? So if God doesn't shatter our neat conceptions of him, he is not God. The incarnation is the supreme example. It leaves all previous ideas of the Messiah in ruins. And most are, of course, he's referring to the New Testament here, offended, scandalized by the divine iconoclasm. And therefore, he enters with our Lord's own words, blessed are those who are not offended in me. The second place where I think Lewis goes off the rails, and here much more controversially, concerns the matter of an objective, timeless, moral foundation. Lewis is what we call a foundationalist, one who believes there must be preliminary things we hold in common and agree upon before there can be any progress in any kind of thought, especially moral thought. As you know, in the abolition of man, which Frank Beckwith will be addressing very helpfully later today, he argues that there is a thing called the Tao, a set of, of universal, timeless, moral, objective norms that characterize all cultures, all civilizations, in all times, in all places, and th that upon these there is no disagreement. I want to argue there is profound disagreement about those so-called objective norms. Rather, all morality is the product of the traditions in time and space and history and culture that produce them. This isn't to say that they don't have a reality beyond ourselves, but it's to say that is where they lie, that's where the engagement, we engage them, that's where we think, that's where we live. I list simply six, five rather, of the ways in which universal objective morality doesn't hold water. The first is suicide. Lewis nowhere bothers to mention in the Tao that the Romans regarded suicide as a very high virtue. In fact, when your life became unlivable, if you did not kill yourself, you were held to be guilty. Uh, Alistair McIntyre points out that imperial Japanese culture had an enormously high regard for suicide. As you know, suicide is one of the first things Christians prohibit. Uh, the early church made it, I think somewhat mistakenly, to be the sin against the Holy Ghost that cannot be forgiven. In any case, suicide is prohibited in the Christian world. It's valued in much, at least in part, of the other worlds we also inhabit. And so to say that there's one single objective morality, uh, this is contradicts it flat out. Child killing, of course, is a common practice. What about all the moral formation of those Romans? They were formed so as to believe you got rid of the children you didn't want. And of course, that's the moral formation that our culture gives us as well. Get rid of your babies. The Didache, published and written uh, roughly in 98 AD, the first post-canonical book, makes the explicit prohibition against the killing of children. It says Christians are those who don't kill their babies. That's what differentiates Christian, Christianity from the Roman world. And of course, that practice is widespread in many, many other cultures, the practice of child killing. That's not an objective moral norm. It's a violation of what Christians regard as God's own directive command. Third, child sacrifice <clears throat> is common to many high cultures. The Aztecs, just to the south of us, practiced, high, practiced <clears throat> child sacrifice. That's the very reason Yahweh commands Israel to depart from the Canaanites. The Canaanites were practitioners of child sacrifice. Come out from among them. Yahweh commands Israel to renounce pagan moral practices, not because they violate some kind of universal neutral moral law, but because they violate God himself. And above all others, above all others, the killing of enemies is the universal moral norm. In fact, if you don't obey that moral norm, you have not been a loyal citizen of your tradition. That becomes the very, the very key central point of the Christian faith. You don't kill your enemies, you forgive them, you bless them. You give hospitality to them. Now, those all have to be qualified. I know there's just war tradition and the like. 
But no other culture has ever exalted the forgiveness of enemies because that is a uniquely Christian moral command. And you have to be, above all, formed. You can't just say to someone, well, don't go out and kill your enemies. You have to be brought up in the church. And that's my final point here. Human conscience is something that doesn't exist by itself. If you've had children, no, we bring into the world little animals. Those little animals have to be formed very quickly. The first and most important word they learn is no. They don't come into the world knowing the meaning of no. And the formation of conscience is, is not simply uh, something that we share in common with all other people. Consciences are formed in radically different ways across all cultures, all times, all places. So the Christian formation of conscience is unique. It's different in large regard. Uh, the Catholics put it very well. They say conscience is inviolable but not infallible. In other words, the church will never coerce conscience. You must do what your conscience tells you. But by golly, you better have a rightly formed conscience to begin with because that conscience is not infallible. Conscience can be hideously erroneous. And so I think Lewis leads us astray in calling conscience to be a kind of, and of course he has Cardinal Newman with him here, so he, he's not by himself. But he's thinking like, it seems to me, a thoroughly modernistic man. Look what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says by contrast. I wish I had the time to read the full passage. It's a thin little book I urge you to get called Creation and Fall, where Bonhoeffer says conscience is not the voice of God within sinful human beings. Instead, it is precisely their defense against this voice. He argues there that Adam and Eve acted on conscience. That is to say, they determined for themselves what was good. And look what happened. So my su summary point here is to say that the main danger of Lewis's modernist apologetics is that he sometimes makes modernist converts. That is to say, Christians who remain uh, simplistic in their faith and worse than that, uh, brittily rationalistic. And the worst place of all that that appears, in my view, is in that dreadful false dilemma that Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. That may be the worst defense of the belief in God ever given. Uh, his, uh, Chad Walsh, the first American scholar of Lewis said, uh, Lewis apparently doesn't understand that God can count beyond two. <laughs> Very witty, no one got it, but it's still witty. Uh, there are at least a dozen alternatives to mad, bad, or God. N.T. Wright says it fails not only <coughs> theologically, it fails historically. Jesus was never viewed simply in those two terms. So I'm urging us not to buy into Lewis's apologetics uncritically. Now notice my word, uncritically. I didn't say we are to reject them in toto, but rather not to embrace them uncritically. What we can embrace, at least less uncritically and therefore much more positively is what I call his imaginative apologetics, where I think R Lewis really succeeds. And here he helps us enormously by defining what imagination is. He says, and I think this is absolutely right, truth is the fact, sorry, reason is the faculty of truth. Imagination is the organ of what he calls on the sometimes meaning and other times, I think, more powerfully, reality. Repeat that. Reason is the faculty of truth. Imagination is the faculty of meaning or reality. And what he means by that, I think, is really right. It goes against the Enlightenment strain because he says, quite rightly, um, that in our fallen condition especially, a truth remains something in the air, abstract, unembodied, often so amorphous and vague as ne necessary to have any impingement upon our lives, upon the way we live and move and have our being in the world. Imagination, by contrast, is, is again a function of the brain. Let's not suggest that the imagination is located outside the brain. But look, as I say there, I think, I hope rightly, uh, the imagination renders its work in the heart through flesh and blood, characters, rhymes, rhythms, colors, images, plots, 
and narrative. And therefore, they have a great twofold effect. The first is imaginative art, especially of Lewis's kind, immerses us into a complex imaginative world where the questions are much more severe and the answers are much less clear. Flannery O'Connor said, if you can read a story with the approach of an algebraist whose game is to find X, when you found X, you can forget it. You don't find X in a Lewis work of imaginative fiction that's well done, and most of them are well done. You find a reality that you have to engage with, and of course, above all, engage with it with the same kind of complexity the gospel has. Some people say, well, the gospel is simple. Yes, any untutored four, any, any properly tutored four-year-old can understand God became flesh and died in our stead and rose to our life. Come, receive. But Richard Don, John Newhouse says we can't get by as adults with that notion. He puts it really well. He says, simplicity for Christians who are mature always lies on the far side of complexity. Simplicity always lies on the far side of complexity. And if we read Lewis aright, we will understand that. And therefore, imagination, as I try to suggest then, really speaks to our hearts, not understood as the realm of emotion or feeling primarily or only, but the realm of desire and therefore the realm of will. Desire and will are located fundamentally in what scripture calls the heart. And the heart was held to be the center of human life for our Hebrew foreparents. Therefore, hardness of heart did not mean lack of feeling or emotion, but blindness to the will and way of Yahweh. The best guide to Lewis's fiction, I think, in addition to Alan Jacobs, present in this room, is that little new book by Rowan Williams. If you don't know it, get thee to the bookstore quickly. It's called The Lion's World. And in that little book, what Williams does is to show that there is no simplistic gospel to be found anywhere in the Narnia Chronicles, in the great divorce, um, and above all, not until we have faces. So I want to here conclude by saying some very obvious things that most of you know already about what I think to be Lewis's best imaginative work. This work is what might be called uh, works of apologue, A-P-O-L-O-G-U-E. That's a technical term uh, in literary criticism that's very, very important. Uh, apologue is, of course, related to apologetics. They have the same basic um, uh, root. But an apologue is an idea that has been, or a set of ideas that have been embedded in fictional form so that you don't get to the kind of truth that that fiction embodies except through the fiction itself. Uh, T.S. Eliot was once asked, for example, to explain the meaning of a poem. Eliot wittily rep re replied, oh, you want me to say it worse. <laughs> so there is no extractable meaning where you can say, this is what Lewis says, full stop. You have to have that meaning embodied in an apologue. In Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, the hideous strength, we find a whole new construction and understanding, I think, very deeply Christian. Lewis is wearing his Christian lenses here. You don't get this elsewhere, of, of gender. What a transformation in our lives if we men understood ourselves in the masculine sense that, that the planet um, um, Malachandra has. It's a masculine world in the best senses of that word. It's a world of steep declivities and transcendent acclivities where the, the, the mountains seem to rush down from the sky. It's angular and it is fierce, but it's also unfallen. So to be masculine doesn't mean to be macho. It doesn't mean to dominate. It doesn't mean to throw one's weight around. Instead, it means to confront true femininity. And there we meet that in the next novel, Paralandra, which is a wonderfully feminine world. It's not angular, it's curvaceous, literally. It's full of undulating turns and curves. It's a watery, not a mountainous world. 
a world where there are these floating islands. Look how Lewis is imagining himself into another world. In the Enlightenment, you can't have a floating island. In the imagination, you have dozens of them. You have these wonderful dolphin-like creatures called sorns that take passengers on their back gladly. You also, and above all, have the green lady, a woman who is naked and who does not tempt to lust, a woman who is unfallen but who has to face temptation for the first time. She has to even learn what temptation would be and how she avoids that temptation is a magnificent embodiment of what it would be like to live in an unfallen world. And then, of course, finally back to our horrible, silent planet, Tultandra, we see the results of that horrific fall which we human beings fell prey to with our Adamic ancestors, where human beings are being operated on as if they were animals. That's our world, and it's a horrific world. Great Divorce is, again, one of my favorite books. Uh, it's Lewis's idea, actually borrowed from Prudentius, an early pope, who said there are days on which the inhabitants of hell are given a vacation. The refugium, ref, refugium, help me, you Latinists, where you, make, you go into a cool place, not a hot place, and there have the chance to see what in, in, in the church is like, purgatory is like, and therefore continue along the purgatorial path to paradise, or seeing what it's like and say, no, I don't want that, going back to hell. Lewis does something similar to that in Great Divorce, where the visitors come to the four courts precincts of heaven, and there have to encounter the sins that put them in hell, and to see whether they want to reverse, to overcome those sins, and alas, on the whole, they decline. They had rather remain ghosts, disembodied ghosts, no, disembodied, than embodied spirits, which of course is what we're meant to be. And his greatest book then, I think, without doubt, is Till We Have Faces. Near the end of his life, Jim Houston, some of you know, was asked, who was a friend of Lewis, asked Lewis, what would you hold to as the books you would most want to be remembered by? And Houston says, without pausing even for a a moment's blink. Lewis answered, the abolition of man until we have faces. And I think he's right, though I think there are problems with abolition of man. I don't think there are many problems with joy, with them. Um, till we have faces, a book written you ladies should know with the close cooperation and assistance of Joy Davidman, the woman who transformed Lewis, I think, from being a sometimes brittle rationalist into being a really imaginative kind of uh, Christian, especially at the end in this book. It features a, a female protagonist. How many of you read Till We Have Faces? Good, that's wonderful. Most audiences I address will say, we don't believe Lewis wrote that book because it is unlike most of Lewis's other work. It features a female protagonist who has the real problem of evil. It's not a theoretical problem. She has a double whammy problem of evil. She has been born without any consultation, any, any kind of desert, any kind of will of her own, unnaturally ugly. And in a primitive, semi-barbaric world, there is no worse fate, I might say, also in an American world where now facelifting is an ordinary practice, to be born ugly. Think of the cosmetic industry, by the way. To be born ugly is to be forever cursed. You have no chance of being married off to a prince. And so she is a woman who has every reason for bitterness. Her bitterness increases, however, when she does the most virtuous thing her life could possibly be given over to. She cares deeply for her sister, half-sister, Psyche. She gives her life to Psyche. She renders herself completely, surrenders herself completely to Psyche. What could be more admirable than that? And yet she finds herself accused of having been jealous of Psyche, of having wanted to dominate and control Psyche, of having to, wanted Psyche to be her own property. And thus in that supposed act of self-giving, she was engaged in a massive self-centeredness. Painfully she comes to understand that. 
Painfully, she comes to understand that God is not nice, that God demands nothing less than total destruction. That's the note on which I want to end then. That is to say, God demands that we be reduced to the ashes of our own self-made hell, or else that we be purified both in suffering and self-surrender as our only true joy. That, I believe, is the Lewis who will be remembered on November 22nd, 2063. Thank you. All right, so we have plenty of time for some question and answers before the break. And I remind you, the break is 15 minutes. And I did that so that there would be time for you guys to continue conversations at your tables with other people as you're going to get something else to drink or a snack. Lewis was a conversationalist, and we want to get a conversation going on campus. And so uh, I urge you to use that interstitial time to continue the conversations about Dr. Wood's talk. So we'll take questions and answers. And in order for your questions to be incorporated into the video for webcast, I'm going to read your question back to you into the microphone, and that'll help us get clear about what the questions are, and then Dr. Wood will address your question. Okay, um, I see one in the back right there. Yes, you. Right. So the question is, you've read Till We Have Faces, you, and now nothing else seems to satisfy you. He's <laughs> like, you've read that and nothing can live up to that. What should, what should someone read as a follow-up to Till We Have Faces that can um, convey or reinforce the sort of message or theme behind Till We Have Faces? Well, first of all, I would say I've done great violence to that novel by giving that little summation of it there at the end. I don't like to call that its message. That's something of what I would more, I think, faithfully call its vision. It's the embodied Christian vision that Lewis gives us there. And therefore, we need to be reading other great books of embodied Christian vision in literary imaginative form. The place to go above all other places is the Brothers Karamazov, as I've just said. That's a book, well, let me back up. T.S. Eliot once said, most of us live our lives by being embarrassed by the books we once admired. We should therefore find authors we can never exhaust, and we should keep on reading until the end of our lives. Eliot, who of course was super smart, super learned, said there were two for him, Dante and Shakespeare. For me, um, Dostoevsky in that novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Thank you. In chapel on Wednesday, when um, Dr. Wood and I and Dr. Evans participated in a group discussion, one of the things that um, came up and Dr. Wood emphasized was that Lewis the reader was one of our most important Lewises. And I confess that until I read Lewis, I had absolutely no patience or interest patience for or interest in any kind of fiction. No poetry, no novels, science fiction, nothing. I just wanted the facts and the arguments. And I feel that um, my intellectual development was increased by becoming an appreciator of the sources uh, that, that Lewis um, incorporated into his imaginative apologetics. We have another question right, right back there. Yes, sir. Yes. So the, the question is essentially, how intentional was the theological aspect of his fictional writing versus it simply being a natural outgrowth of his own views as he was writing? 
Again, that's, that's a splendid question. Lewis said, I'm an evangelist all the time I work. Uh, I want to make converts to the, to the faith. But he came to see there are more than one way, there uh, are more than one ways, two ways of making um, converts to the faith. Uh, there's a moving passage where he says he's giving up apologetics. He's come to the end of that road. And that, that kind of direct frontal assault, which Kierkegaard called the old military science, repudiating apologetics, by the way, uh, he said it come to an end. He wanted to spend the rest of his life trying to give imaginative embodiment to the same gospel, but note well, the same gospel that was undergoing radical revision in his understanding of it, as God was shattering every image of him that he had. And so um, in those books, he doesn't come out at the place necessarily where he started or even wanted to. Because the great power of inspiration is that it overcomes our little minuscule ideas. I receive uh, uh, term papers from my class on Thursday and ask, how many of you came out at the point where you started and you thought you would? Not a hand went up. Because it's in the writing, as, as by the way, Orwell says, I came to see myself in my writing. Augustine says the same thing, of course, about memory. So I think Lewis' intentions were pretty much the same, but both his realization of them and even his understanding of them underwent radical revision in, uh, a transformation would be a better word, in the writing of his fiction. And Roy Williams is really good on that in the Narnia Chronicle. We've got uh, a couple of questions over there. We've got plenty of time, so I want to do a quick follow-up. Um, uh, Lewis clearly transitioned from more apologetic writing to more imaginative writing. But um, do you think that his philosophical training and his reading of hardcore philosophy, uh, hardcore theology, was valuable for his phase as an imaginative apologist? Absolutely. Absolutely. So please do not misunderstand me if in any way denigrated abstract thinking. Um, my best friends, to be honest with you, are in the philosophy department here at Baylor. Um, because it's only when you've thought hard and long about difficult questions abstractly that you can come to see them as they appear concretely in, in, in works of fiction. So the more theology you read, the more philosophy you read, the better off you will be. And Lewis had done that. Lewis got a triple, unprecedented, triple first at Oxford. He got Phi Beta Kappa degrees three times, and the most basic one was what was called, we would call classics, where he mastered the great Greek and Roman works of philosophy, culture, literature, and art. Okay, yeah, right back there, ma'am. Yes, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and he's very well suited to answer this question. Can you just give a, a, a brief compare contrast between Lewis and Tolkien in the ways that they engaged in this same or similar endeavor of imaginative apologetics? Uh, yes, I have an essay on that on my website. This is shameful self-advertisement. <clears throat> uh, go and look. But basically, Tolkien got it right from the start. Tolkien, I'll be very candid here, I think due to his deep, deep formation in Catholic faith, was never tempted by the Enlightenment enterprise. So that when he came to write his works, of course the, his masterwork above all, he doesn't ever attempt to view things from above. He starts deeply from within. In fact, those works were inspired by his understanding and creation of languages. He created, you probably know, two forms of Elvish and came to see, well, languages don't come from nowhere. They come from cultures. So what would a culture be like that could produce hobbits, that could produce wizards, that could produce all the things you find in Lord of the Rings? So Tolkien never dallied with the Enlightenment project. And that's why I think it's Tolkien who will last, finally, longer than Lewis. 
Okay, we have time for just one or two more questions, and then um, you can come ask Dr. Wood uh, during the break, as long as you let him get over to the other room to get some refreshment. So uh, right there, and then we'll uh, have uh, doc this guy right here give the last, uh, last question. So he wants to know what are what are some of the other options besides Lord, Liar, and Lunatic. I will have to say one of them rhymes, one of them starts with L, which is legend. And uh, I do think Lewis addressed that, but that's that's one that would formally have to at least be in there. But so he just wants to know what, what are the other alternatives that you had in mind? This is going to seem like dodging your question, but it isn't. Christians don't proceed that way. Christians don't ask what possibilities, seem to be the deepest kind of Christians, to be honest here, don't start with asking what kind of categories might God fit in or might Christ fit in. The order is always the other way around. We have been given this Lord, this Christ, this church, this body, this culture, this art. That's where Christians begin and then say, what is implied by that? What kind of Lord is he? Why do the, do the Greeks, do the Greek Christians seize upon the word kurios to describe who this Jesus is? They could have chosen many other terms. So the way to begin is always from what has been given in Israel, in Christ, in the church, and therefore in the tradition which it produced, and then ask into what categories might those, that culture be translated to the world. Therefore, they, as I said recently, the motto of our own Brooks College is fides quirens intellectum. Faith, seeking understanding, not starting out with understanding first and then finding how faith might fit into it. Okay, right over here. Yes. So the idea is that the trilemma isn't a, uh, advanced, an argument that is advanced out, but rather a defense against a claim that is made. The claim being the common uh, view at the time that, oh, he's a great moral teacher, but I I'm not going to worship him like a god. He wouldn't even want that. And that, in, and in especially, I mean, the trilemma appears in multiple places, but at least in mere Christianity, he says, he, you know, he didn't leave that option open to us and he didn't mean to. So he's, he's saying, uh, isn't there a difference between advancing this as I'm going to show you who Jesus is versus uh, responding to what he thought was a silly way of thinking about Jesus? Good question. It has, uh, I think, a two-part answer. The first of all, I would ask the person, where did you get that question? Where did that come from? What tradition made you skeptical of Jesus? Why do you think he is a great moral teacher? And the answer is you're an enlightenment product. That is the great advance. By the way, we would not be in this room without the enlightenment. I'm not bashing the enlightenment. Um, you know, I'm not wanting to give up chloroform. Uh, I'm not wanting to give up my hearing aids without which my career had been over 25 years ago. So the very question is an enlightenment question. And my fear is that Lewis gives it an enlightenment answer. That was, very, that was very brief, actually. So, uh, Dr. Beatty, do you still have a...
Yeah, so since Aquinas believed in a natural law um, that was the, he defined as the rational creature's participation in the eternal law, um, is this in conflict with what McIntyre says? Is, uh, is Aquinas also buying into the Enlightenment picture uh, several hundred years early? Um, so can you, can you clarify your, your remarks about um, the, the Tao and uh, incommensurable traditions with the, the idea of natural law and an eternal law? Well, again, that's a very complex question. There are huge disagreements about Aquinas. There's a book called Divine Science that argues that Aquinas does not hold to the natural law as something that can be arrived at neutrally. <clears throat> that already that is an interested discovery <clears throat> that is grounded in, in Aquinas' own deep Christian commitments with which he begins. But more than that, I would say, look how Aquinas believes whatever this natural law might be, is, must be radically not only completed and perfected by grace and reason, but totally transformed by them. For example, in the ancient world that Aquinas inherited from Aristotle, the highest form of courage, the virtue of courage, one of the four basic virtues from the Greeks, is to die in battle in defense of one's own nation and people. Aquinas says that's just backward. That's exactly backward for Christians. Christians exhibit the highest expression of the virtue called courage, <clears throat> not in killing and dying in battle, but being willing to be killed for their faith. So that martyrdom becomes the true Christian expression of courage so that you get a total revision of the natural law in, in, in Aquinas and not simply a kind of extension of it. Okay, so we started a little bit late and we went cut into the break a little bit to, to give Dr. Wood his full time. Um, I think we can certainly say that we do not get from Dr. Wood an uncritical, unreflective acceptance of Lewis and let's thank him for challenging us. There are refreshments in the other